Well, I think that was one of the reasons why the physicians were a little bit right. hesitant because I, I really had no experience in the area. Um, but of course, there really weren't a lot of derm PAs around. Um, but, you know, I had to learn a whole new language pretty much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy, for coming on. Hi, guys. Welcome to eShadowing. Um, as you all know, we have Sandy Morris here with us today, who is a dermatology PA. Um, and as you guys heard, I was um, telling Sandy, it's been great that she's been in dermatology or been a PA for over 20 years. So we're excited to learn about her journey to becoming a PA. And um, of course, I'm sure you guys will have a ton of questions to ask Sandy, along with her presenting a dermatology case study. All righty. Okay. <laughs> so we'll jump right into it. Um, Sandy, can you please um, tell us like why you chose PA, how you went about learning about the profession, um, especially, you know, in the late 90s when you went to PA school. It was still a, you know, new career back then too. Uh, so how did you learn about PA and why did you choose PA? Well, truly, I was interested in medicine. Um, and I was living in Memphis and I was working at St. Jude and in uh, virology and I ended up having to make a, cha a move and I ended up working at in the Emory laboratory because I was a medical technologist in a prior life oh, okay, cool. and a PA came down to the lab and I had no idea what that was mm -hmm. and then they worked for infectious disease and then I found out what a PA was and it sounded like the perfect compromise for me at the time that I would could go into medicine, but still it wouldn't take me as long. And at the time I was married, so there were a lot of uh, issues at, at that time. So it sounded like the perfect thing for me. And uh, so I applied to Emory and fortunately got in. And uh, that was in 94. Wow. I know. Well, <laughs> I was, I was like <laughs> I was so Back like, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> <laughs> no, the 90s were amazing. <laughs> yeah, I graduated in um, 1997. Wow, that's awesome. So how, okay, first, um, I know with being a laboratory tech, um, you know, you weren't really getting, like, like talking to patients directly. So did that count as patient care experience? Yes, um, I was... I went from Emory over to what was at that time Eggleston Children's Hospital, which is okay. which is part of CHOA, and um, I started their virology lab from scratch. And so, as part of that, I frequently went up on the floor, like through the AFLAC with the with the oncology pediatric oncology group, and I would talk to um, talk about uh, collecting specimens and things like that. And and I would have to collect specimens frequently and so I had mm -hmm. interaction with okay. uh, patients and the parents okay um, so that yes at that time I don't think they had the specific like number of contact hours and because I was a medical technologist I think that counted totally through to my healthcare experience mm, okay Okay, that's awesome. So um, how did you go, uh, go about, well, actually, before that, how was PA school or the application process back then? I mean, now it's like so super, super, super competitive. Um, there's so many little, you know, ins and outs of applying to PA school. It's like as diff or more difficult than medical school. So how was it back then? Uh, well, it was just as harrowing, I think, that <laughs> as it is now. Um, and... We didn't have like the, uh, 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 what do you call it with the medical school, the, the central. Oh, Casper? Uh, yeah, we didn't okay. have that. Okay. And so uh, I still actually have my uh, um, folder and everything, but we had to write an essay okay. and you had to have a certain uh, GPA and right. it had to be in the sciences and then you had to have the GRE and then you had to be invited for an interview and then, um, you know, they would tell you whether you were selected or not. Yeah. Um, the interview process was kind of interesting at the time because there might be maybe eight people interviewing at a time. And we would have a group interview. 
And I guess the, the purpose was to see how we interacted with each other, how we responded to each other's comments about questions. And, um, and then we had an individual interview or interview with someone that was on the um, selection committee. Mm. Um, yeah. So you ever go back to Emory uh, to like visit or kind of see, you know, how things I haven't been in a while. I used to teach quite a lot. Um, and then I think, um, you know, as things I've been around for so long, a lot of things have changed. And I think that, you know, we've got uh, the newer people in, but, um, I, yeah, it's interesting because when I very first started, we had individual desks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I could hang my purse over my chair and that was yeah. my desk. And now it's long tables and everybody's yeah. got their computers and it, it, it's, it's different. Yeah. How many students were in your cohort? Probably 50. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that's a, that was a full class at that time. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. And um, how was your experience once you got into PA school? Like how was like didactic year and then um, transitioning to clinical year? What was your like favorite class, least favorite or toughest class? How was um, being in PA school at Emory at the time? Well, I was married at the time. So oh. and I lived probably, I don't know, hour and a half from where class was. So that made it a little bit hard by the time I got home to start studying, but I didn't have kids. And there were, there were several people in our class that did. One had five. Oh my I God. I don't know how she did yeah. it. I really don't, yeah. but, um, but she did and she's uh, doing great. Uh, but <clears throat> it's like, I always say it's like drinking from a fire hose, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it is so much information and when you have your basic classes, like, you know, biochemistry and um, all that, it's kind of hard to sort of fit it all in. You don't understand how that translates into what you're getting ready to learn in your um, didactic, your PA classes. Um, and then once you get into clinicals, it starts making a little more sense. I wish I could go back now and retake PA and I would be... I would know when I hear something, I, I, it would be so much, I, I would learn, I think, so much more. But, you know, it, it's just like anything. Until you start using it, you don't really, you know, you don't really know how it's going to fit. And then going right. through the different um, specialties and everything. Um, but it's fun. It's fun. It's interesting. It's tiresome. Um, but it's worth it. Right. It is. It is very much worth it. And it goes by fast. It might not seem like it at the time, but it actually goes by fast. And then, you, you know, you develop friendships and, you know, do things other than study. And, you know, we had a study group and each one of us was re was, uh, you know, responsible for different lectures. And we had to come in with like a one page synopsis of the lecture. Mm. Um, so, you know, and there are a lot of parties and, you know, you just it's um, it's it's good. <laughs> right. So how was clinical year? Is that was that when you kind of decided that you wanted to do derm or? No, actually. Um, <clears throat> when I first went in, I thought I wanted to do pediatric oncology because mm -hmm. I had been at St. Okay. Jude and I really, really loved that place. And um, so but when I got out, uh, I ended up doing something totally different, which we can talk about later. But um, clinical year is uh, is awesome. <laughs> you just never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And that's true now. You just, you know, you've got your bread and butter stuff, things that you see all the time, like UTIs, you know, for you and stuff. You know, for me, it's like mm -hmm. acne and rosacea. But then somebody comes in and you're like, oh, OK, this is not what I'm used to. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and that's true for, I think all of them, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I, I, I knew I liked procedures. Um, I mean, I, I didn't really, when I say procedures, I guess my background is microbiology and, and immunology. Okay. So I love anything that's related to the microscope, you know, bacteria, whatever. And so, you know, I love to IND cysts and stuff like that. Um, but I, I really started in renal. Oh, wow. wow. That's a tough specialty. Yeah. <laughs> How did I, you start in renal? How did you end up there? Well, 
I was open at the time to just about anything, really. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to just get out and start working. And there was a practice up in Piedmont um, and they did, they never had a PA before. So I was their first PA. Mm -hmm. And then they hired another PA for my class up in about six months. So we both were there and we had deaths opposite each other. Um, but yeah, that was, that was interesting. I learned a lot and I taught a lot of Emory, uh, a lot of renal stuff like that. So what prompted me to go into dermatology was I was getting ready to move from Atlanta to Noonan. And somebody called me from Wisconsin and said, Hey, you know, do you know any, any positions open in renal? So I wasn't sure I went over to the Emory and at the time <laughs> they have a black book <laughs> and you would open it up and everything was on pages. You know, you would have to go through to see what the openings were. Oh, Gosh, really? I feel so old. Um, but I was going through it and I noticed there was a position in dermatology in Noonan. Oh, that, that worked out. And so, you know, I started thinking about it and all the things about derm were, and I never did actually a special uh, 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 rotation in dermatology specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I interviewed for that and the, and the doctors were a little concerned because I was in internal medicine and how would I be coming to such a specialized area? And dermatology is really, I mean, it's really kind of different. It's a whole new uh, language. It's, it's, it's a lot, a lot of different things. Um, but it turned out perfect. And, uh, it's, I've been there ever since. Wow. It, so you've been with the same practice. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So you're like family now. Yeah. Wow. That's We've amazing. been through a lot of changes. Um, just so, but it's, I've been hanging in there. Wow. We actually have a, um, in, interesting, um, question. She uh -huh. actually answered the first part about how you decided on the specialty, but someone asked, did you change your mind at any point? Was there any moment in time where you're like, Oh, I don't know. I want if I want to do this or started looking at other jobs and then kind of stuck with derm or in terms of dermatology. Right. Um, no, that's good. No. I mean, in derm, you know, you see all ages, Mm -hmm. I mean, babies all the way up to 90s. OK, um, you see uh, all kinds of infections. You see rashes. I, I mean, the, the, it's a huge variety. Plus, you do procedures, um, skin cancer surgeries, um, you know, INDs, biopsies, I, you know. Uh, and then if you're interested in cosmetic procedures, there's some of those available. I pr particularly like general derm. But um, so there's a huge variety. Um, but, you know, you don't get to use your stethoscope very much, <laughs> but you might use it once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know it's different. It is. It is. I actually did my um, I did one of my rotations in Durham because it was actually my lowest pack rat score. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to do a, my selective in Durham, it's just kind of based on your weak areas, and Durham mm -hmm. was my weakness. So, um, yeah, I did Durham, and um, I saw mainly uh, like most surgeries. Uh, well, we saw, mm -hmm. yeah, there was a day for surgery, and um, but he was like, they were so fast because they had like 50 patients in a day, and uh, so it was, it was a lot, it was a lot. People kind of go into Durham thinking that it's easy, it's actually not being well. I didn't do so well in Durham, but it's actually pretty hard, guys. I think that you probably, and I don't know about with the ER, you, we might be neck and neck with you. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you do see probably more more patients than you would say with internal medicine, um, yeah. you know, hematology. I mean, because, well, one, the access to dermatologists has been not that great. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the reason why PAs have been so um, successful in the dermatology field. And instead of having to wait three months to see the physician, you know, you might need to wait three weeks or two weeks to see the PA. Mm -hmm. I mean, then of course, if you need to bring the physician in, you do. So it's almost like having a, a physician visit. So, uh, and in terms of quality of life, you know, even though we see a lot of patients, uh, the quality of life is is good. Yeah, yeah. The only issue is, you know, getting my chart notes done. <laughs> <laughs> there, I usually don't have time while I'm actually seeing the patients yeah. get my chart notes done. But uh, that's always kind of up there in the, you know. But outside <laughs> of that, 
um, you know, there are a few emergencies, although there are some, and you mm -hmm. have to be able to identify whether that's the case. Um, and, um, you know, we don't take call. Right. In our particular <laughs> practice. I did take call when I was in uh, renal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a it's different. Yeah. Nice. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we already have some questions coming in from students. Um, someone asks, how has the PA profession changed over the last 20 years? What do you think it may progress to in the future? Wow. <laughs> well, I think certainly uh, it's much people know what PAs do now. When I was when I was going through, there was there, there, they knew, but they still didn't totally understand. Yeah. And of course, now we have the the name change to physician associate, and I'm hoping that's not going to be too confusing. At least we have the PA. The letters are still the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see that probably. I mean, we want to be a team. We're, we're a team or oriented profession. Right. Um, but I see that the autonomy is probably going to increase the, the, the amount of autonomy that we have. Yeah. Um, I've seen changes in how we um, um, are recertified. Um, well, obviously, I mean, there has been so many changes with just even with the met with the science, the genetics and things like that, uh, yeah. you know, that really wasn't there when I was going through or was just getting started. Right, right. Right, right. That's true. Um, I was going to actually, speaking of autonomy, I was going to ask, how was the learning curve when you first started? And then now I'm, you know, you're like an expert. So I'm sure you don't have much interaction with the physician or you don't, you're not as reliant on the physician mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, ask, I guess, asking questions or handling difficult cases. So how was that when you started? Well, I think that was one of the reasons why the physicians were a little bit Right. Hesitant because I I really had no experience in the area. Um, but of course, there really weren't a lot of derm PAs around. Um, but, you know, I had to learn a whole new language, pretty much. All the the names of the diseases. It's a whole. Um, it's very visual and you have to be able to describe things. Yeah. And uh, and you have to do it in a way that if somebody else looked at the chart note, they could have some idea what you're talking about. And there are certain uh, words that you use, things like that. Like you don't say zit, <laughs> you know, you do, you do what you're yeah, talking yeah, about. But you don't put zit in the chart note, <laughs> um, you know. But anyway, uh, there's um, that that that's a bit of a learning curve. Right. But if you have people that are willing to, to teach you. And then within the uh, Society of Durham PAs, they have what's called a DLI, Distance Learning Initiative, which is awesome. And it's a whole um, program composed of different lectures and uh, pre and post tests um, to get you really where you need to be in terms of doing Durham, because it is, it, there, there's a lot to right. know in it. Fortunately, you know, on your regular day to day, you're not going to see a whole lot of crazy things, but you're going to see some. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, uh, so how is the day to day in Durham? Like, what are your hours like? Um, what's the patient population? What are common cases that you see? And do you um, assist the doctor ever in surgery? To, um, so how is a day in the life in Durham? Well, I usually go in really early in the morning because I'm trying to, you know, catch up on uh, any kind of chart notes I need to do. Plus, I have uh, for all my pathology reports that come back, because that's the other thing that's interesting in Durham. You have all these histology. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot about that. Um, and, you know, you have to, uh, you know, get your letters together um, for your negatives, decide who you're going to call for your positives, what you're going to do. Uh, so anyway, then I pull off my uh, um, schedule for the day. And I personally, that's why I go in so early. I go through each each patient and I see what they're here for, what they were here for last, whether I saw them or did somebody else um, and kind of give me an idea what to expect. Uh, things that I would do frequently are what are called full body skin exams or annual yeah. exams. We just go from head to toe. They keep their underclothing on if they want to or not. Um, I always say if it's got skin on it, we're we're going to deal with it. <laughs> 
because some patients are embarrassed about different yeah. things. Um, but uh, yeah, you never know. I might have five full bodies in a row and, and then I might have, you know, a rash and then I might have uh, some acne and rosacea, some molluscum. You know, I, I mean, it's very varied. And that's one of the things I like. And the physicians in the practice that I'm in expect us really to be able to see anything that they would see. Mm. So it's not like I get all rosacea and acne. Right. Um, and if I have a question, honestly, even though I've been there for so long, you kind of get a feeling when you talk to the patients about whether they really need a little more reassurance, you know, and I have no problem calling the physician in and they, they're very good. And sometimes they don't come in right away, but they're excellent about, uh, about uh, supporting us. And they're very, um, like they'll say, oh, I, I agree with what Sandy says. This, you know, she's uh, right on the money about this and that and the other. So they edify, which is good to make the practice. You right. know, they have to be comfortable. Um, but yeah, I don't usually, maybe four times a week, something like that. But I work, I'm been in another thing. I only work three days a week, which is really awesome. <laughs> so it's not like you work 12 hour sh shifts, right? How? No, I go in, my, my day starts at eight. I see my last patient at 4.35. Awesome. But I'll be honest with you, you know, frequently we're behind, mm -hmm. you know, so frequently I'm not mm -hmm. done at five o'clock, uh, <laughs> which we're trying really hard to, to um, um, manage that, but you just never know what you're going to get. And somebody might say, oh, well, you know, oh yeah, I've got this and I've got that. The, uh, oh, by the way, things, which every specialty and every, you know, everybody that's in the PA in medicine at all understands that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> thank you. for yes. that. Okay. Uh, we have some of course more question. Um, do you think being a lab tech before PA school gave you an advantage over others in your cohort or even in Durham? Yes, but, uh, you know, I have an advantage in that area. Like anytime, you know, somebody has to have a question about what kind of lab test to order, how to, how to collect it, any of that kind of stuff, you know, or especially micro stuff, PCR, um, I love KOH preps um, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I always get get asked and, and I like infectious disease. So I get asked a lot about that. It did help me in PA school because I understood a lot about the testing that they were doing. Uh, maybe not like I, not EKGs, but laboratory testing that we would do. Um, and uh, it's just like being a radiology tech. You, you know a lot about the radiology. Right. Um, so, you know, it gives you a little bit of advantage in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not sure if you remember this, but a, a one student wants to know, how did you practice for the interview process for PA school? I can around, I remember it. Uh, well, let's see. Because <laughs> um, I, I barely recently, remember mine. It was like, I, <laughs> one of the people that was... Uh, on the committee worked at Eggleston when I was there okay. and I talked to him and he came down and actually, uh, I think he did kind of like a pre-interview, even though, you know, um, and I, you, basically you talk to other PAs, talk to people, um, you know, what do they do? What do they ask? Um, you know, and I know particularly in, in when I was in school, it really wasn't a good idea really to mention, specialties really you want primary care mm -hmm. because really that's how our whole profession started right. was to do primary care and particularly in um you know uh, rural areas areas right. where physicians were not available um and now it's just blown up and it's just it's everywhere <laughs> so um yeah and uh you know things you know ethical questions um you know, and probably I'm sure COVID questions and um, yeah, it's kind of like you don't really know what they're going to ask. And sometimes yeah. they ask you like something that has nothing whatsoever to do with medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so. True. That's true. Okay. So this question is really good too. Um, what was the most important part about staying with the same practice? Uh, I guess she's trying to ask what kept you there? What did you look for now that you wanted to stay there? What quality made it work? Yeah, that's a good question because I never expected myself to be in a place 
that long. And I actually thought I would be in an academic setting. Um, but I think that uh, I love my patients. And um, that's one thing. The physicians that I worked with, they had expectations and they were they trained me. They have never had an issue coming in to see a patient with me. Um, if I have to do a curbside consult, no problem. Um, so I feel like I was very well supported and I feel like I was respected um, for the knowledge that I did have. And I think they understood that, it, that they could trust the fact that I would not do something over, you know, beyond what I should be doing. Um, you know, so, uh, but because of the variation, the variety of everything, uh, I, I just really like to one physician and we had a research practice also, it's called Metaphase. So that was kind of interesting because I was a pharmacist for that. So I kind of got involved in some of the research aspects, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, but they, you know, came from Harvard, um, uh, uh, Emory, um, Penn State, uh, I mean, University of Pennsylvania. So it came from like very, you know, uh, John Hopkins. So I was like, well, I was in awe of that. And so I certainly had a lot of respect for them when I started. And um, it just sort of, I don't know, I just stayed that way. <laughs> Although I'll tell you, sometimes I wish I had some experience in another practice to look at something differently, you know, because yeah. I'm so used to what I've been taught. And that's true for physicians. They get taught by a certain yeah, person it. or, or um, um, because we'll get new people in and they have other ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think, wow, you know, I really wish I had more, more options, but then I get to learn from them. So yeah, You're always <laughs> learning. Always. <laughs> so uh, what's the most common diagnosis in DERM? Um, if, and if you can't think of like one, maybe the three top three cases that you see, as a derm PA? Well, a lot of that depends on the age group. No, okay. that's true. So if you're talking about, you know, older patients, obviously skin cancer, okay. uh, basal cell, squamous cell, um, and then, you know, your melanoma. Um, you know, in younger kids, usually acne. Um, and then, you know, you've got rashes in all different areas, um, rosacea, uh, fungal infections. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to say. I'd say probably I see a lot of older patients. So I think probably I do a lot of uh, skin cancer okay. um, identification. And uh, I used to, uh, not now because I'm seeing more patients, but I did some skin cancer surgeries also, not Mohs, but okay. just basic elliptical excisions. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Really yeah, cool. it, yeah, age is very important in derm when you're yeah. trying to when, when you're trying to determine what's going on with with the patient. That's true. Let's try to think about that. <laughs> so, um, one question. Let's see. Um, this is actually I'm not sure if you know, but derm is actually really really hard to get a job. And I have a friend. Um, she's you know we work in the ER together. And she's always wanted to do derm and um, derm or aesthetics, but um, she says it's so hard to get a job unless you know someone. But um, what do you recommend um, when landing a job in Durham for students? Like if that's what they want to do after graduating or, you know, if that's if they're you know trying to switch uh, specialties. Right. How do you, you know, get a job in Durham? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, because the problem now is finding a practice that is willing and has the time to train you because mm -hmm. it is not something that I mean, you have to be trained. You have to be trained in, you know, what to look for and you have to be trained in how to do the procedures right. and it takes practice to do, you know, um, there are available and, and honestly, I couldn't tell you where they are right now. Um, there are some fellowship dermatology fellowships, yeah. you know, and that would certainly give you an in. Um, but you know, a lot of people either don't have the time or the money to do that. So you want to, you know, do it right after you get out of school, you need to try to find out, you know, what your local PA society is and try to see if you can go to those meetings and network and find out potentially where positions are. Um, if you can, the, 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 the distance learning initiative is 
you know, that's really good. Now you have to belong to the SDPA, Society of Dermatology PAs, which actually you have to belong to the American Academy of Physician Assistants in order to belong to that. But uh, that would be another way to uh, um, gain knowledge. And then, you know, shadowing, just at least when you talk to them, have some idea what is expected. How is it different from what you're doing? Why do you want to do it? You know, what yeah. is it about dermatology that interests you um, right. specifically? Not, you know, a quality of life is good, but that's not your number one thing. Um, yeah. Pay. Pay is great. That shouldn't be your number one thing. Even it might be, but don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, do you recommend like working as an MA, as a PA to in a derm office to get that experience? You know, that is really, that I think right now I can think of three MAs in our practice that are now PAs. Wow. Mm -hmm. We've got one right now that wants to go. Yeah. So if you can do that, yes. Okay. If that's an area you want to go into, but I would tell you, you know, I wouldn't have any set ideas before you go in mm -hmm. to PA school because you just never know. Yeah. What, you know, I never would have expected to be in, well, certainly not renal, but certainly not, not dermatology <laughs> at this point. So. <laughs> okay guys so we'll answer one more question from you guys and then we'll move on to the case study and then answer some more questions if we have time um let's see all right let me just try to see okay and so um how have you addressed conditions specific to certain groups of people like how particularly groups of people are affected differently like hyperpigmentation in more melanin rich populations or mm -hmm. even acne in babies versus adults how do you address your different patients that's a really good question especially these days because of so much diversity right. and i'll be honest in dermatology probably a bulk of every everything we have is in it, it, Caucasian. Yeah. <laughs> um, not, a, I mean, you know, I'd say more for sure. And, you know, the darker skin, hyperpigmentation, um, that is something that I get a lot. Uh, also hair loss, mm -hmm. scarring hair loss or non-scarring hair loss. There is a difference and that difference needs to be addressed. And I, in terms of how uh, things present on different type, on different skin colors, on different skin types. Um, and I think that that has certainly come to the forefront. And I think that, uh, I mean, there is a, a, a whole new um, group called diversity in dermatology. And the whole point is, is to, to look at all variations because mm -hmm. there is a difference. And, you know, I, the minorities are not well represented in yeah. the dermatology pre and I think that they are working to change that and I think that you know we need to know more right. about that because there are some differences right yeah. yeah yeah and I think also I found that you know a lot of min uh, minorities or people of darker um, skin complexions they may think that you know they're not at risk for skin cancer because they think it's like you know something that may only affect Caucasians when that's not true so a lot of it is just like also patient education too. well and you know trying to uh when you're talking about hyperpigmentation, um, mm -hmm. you know, trying to discuss wearing sunscreen when it's not something you've ever thought about doing yeah. or ever thought yeah. you would need. Yeah. And it's hard enough to get the people that need it to use it. Yeah. So sometimes sure. that's a little bit challenging. Um, yeah. And I think just really with the education of why mm -hmm. under certain circumstances you would need to do that right. and how that's going to help in the, in, the, in the future in terms of whether that pigment's going to get worse or not. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then you have to just you have to be able to talk about different types of sunscreens and which ones might be more beneficial. Um, you know, so <laughs> when you talk about zinc oxide and, and titanium dioxide, those are kind of thicker and whiter. And so you have to kind of think about some different options. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I live by my sunscreen. I love wearing sunscreen. <laughs> That's very true. I mean, one of my first patients had a basal cell on her she was african-american and it was on her back and i swear i thought it was going to be a melanoma it was bleeding it was black it was big um and i did a little uh i did something for jap on it but anyway yeah so basal cells are not that uncommon um so and then so anyway that was kind of interesting because that is not what i was expecting 
Wow. So, how, so um, you just, you know, you said it was bleeding and everything. And then um, how long had she had it? And did she come in for that? Or did you kind of just I notice it? in for that? Okay. Um, I don't know, probably a couple months. Yeah. Wow. At least. Yeah. Wow. And, and how just started bleeding. Well, was she like older? Um, so what was this? She was probably 55. Wow. 50s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay, guys. So um, we'll move on to the case study. We'll give Sandy a chance to present the case study so you guys can learn some more and then answer um, questions, of course. I'm sorry if I don't get to all of your questions. <laughs> this is such an interesting session, but um, you guys will try our best to answer some more questions at the an end of the case study. Okay. So I'm going to I have a little slide thing. Yeah. Slide yeah. thingy. <laughs> okay, yeah, so. To go to slides and add new presentation. It should. Okay. So just hit start. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is me. <laughs> okay. So, you know, and this is true for any area in medicine, the differential, you know, what, is the, what are the possibilities? What possibilities make sense? You know, which one's the most likely, second most likely, et cetera. And eventually what's gonna happen is my MA will come out and say, oh, they have this and this and this. And I'm like, before I even go into the room, I have a differential. I don't wanna have tunnel vision, but I have a differential and I know kind of what I'm expecting to see. Um, and in dermatology, really, the thing is, is you have to know what kind of what is the primary lesion, because so many people pick their lesions, things like that. So um, once they get it picked, you can't tell what it is. And you need to know, is it a is it a vesicle? Is it a plaque? Uh, is it a macule? That's a whole uh, area that, that that that's part of the learning curve is how to do one you have to identify well what kind of lesion is it then you have to decide well is this lesion kind of like a skin cancer and an individual or is this lesion potentially part of a rash and if it is part of a rash then how do you look at that lesion to determine what rash it might be part of and then you have to look at where is it located is it located only on the face is it located from the head to toe is it located in the armpits only in the umbilicus between the toes, just on a fingernail, because dermatology is hair, skin, and nails. Um, and a lot of systemic conditions will be will present in one or more, obviously, of those areas. So you have to look at the distribution, and then you have to look at the pattern. Is it go along the skin fold lines? Um, does it go along the lines of Blaschko? So there's various different patterns? Is it a Christmas tree pattern? Things like that, that, uh, that you um, learn to uh, uh, appreciate. And then you have to know their age. Like you have a patient that's seven and they have a, a bullous rash, blistering rash. I mean, bullous pemphigoid is not going to be an option there because that's usually in 60 year olds, you know. So the age can help guide you. Um, and then the ethnicity, because uh, certain things occur in different uh, um, ethnicities versus others. And then some things are more common in men versus women, et cetera. So you got to take all that into consideration. Plus, you take the history into consideration. So it's a lot of stuff. There are some, some people, I work with one. <laughs> I'll have him come in and I'll try to give him the history. He'll, I, I, oh, oh. He doesn't want to hear anything. He just wants to see it and make his decision, which I, I personally don't think, you know, but he's, he's been doing it for years and he's excellent. So, I mean, it's just a different way of doing things. Um, and then he might ask for history if he can't see, figure it out from the beginning. Um, so here's a case study here. A 26 year old male comes to the clinic, got a well-defined annular lesion on the shin. Started out small, has gotten somewhat larger over the past several weeks. Not really that much itchy, kind of scaly. It's weepy. And it's been that way since it started. Been there about three weeks. He did have an insect bite at the location before it came up and he's not really done anything with it. And so this is what it looks like. So, you know, it's a single lesion. It's gone from small to big, which means it's growing. Um, it's weeping, um, not, not necessarily itchy. So actually when you look at this, 
uh, your differential. What is your differential? Okay, so most likely tinea corpus ringworm. And that's based on the fact that it's gone from small to big. It's annular. Um, it was after a bug bite because frequently insects will have fungal spores. And when they bite you, they will can sometimes put a spore in and you end up with a, a little fungal infection. Um, but the fact that it's weepy and it's really, really um, active means it's probably an animal source rather than from, there's only three places you can get it, the soil, people, and animals. Animals are really immunogenic. So that kind of, it gets kind of swollen. Um, so another option would be eczema and acute eczema would be like uh, poison ivy because it's weeping, although it's a single area, you know, that probably isn't that much. Uh, of a likelihood, third most allergic contact dermatitis, especially if they tell you they put Neosporin on it because it was allergen of the year one year. So um, so there's all kinds of, and then obviously staph is a possibility. Um, so you've got all these things going on. And at least it's only a single lesion when you've got like 20 different ones and sometimes it's a little bit harder. But uh, so what would you do? Well, if you if you think there's fungus in there, you can scrape it onto a slide, which I love doing. I'm, uh, when, when I, I, I don't know how much time, but, but when I worked in uh, renal, inter we did internal medicine, <laughs> my doc would knock on the door and he'd go, I have a scraping opportunity. And he would want me to scrape something so I could look at it under the microscope. But anyway, um, so we'll do a KOH or a potassium hydroxide, um, which you can actually see the fungus in the specimen. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. But you can do a fungal culture, which takes a little while. But nowadays, PCR is quick, except now I think all the PCRs are getting overrun with COVID. So there's all the other ones are taking a lot longer to get. Um, but if you did a PCR, you could look for staph. You could look for everything in a single specimen, which is awesome. Um, so, uh, if the KOH is positive, then you're done. Uh, now if the KOH is negative, then you can either wait for these or, uh, sometimes we'll, uh, do something to enhance the fungus and help with the symptoms, which is usually putting a topical steroid on it, making them come back and we repeat the test. Um, but so... In, in order to go through the second and third, most likely, you know, you're all, you're looking at it's KOH negative. What is the history? And you might say, I know that is fungus. I know that's, that's got to be fungus, especially if you've been doing it for long enough. And you may choose to treat at that point. Um, and then you just put in your notes, you know, I chose to treat because what? Um, so anyway, you have to go through all those different things. But in this case, your first test is a KOH, which is what this is. And see the fungal hyphae? It's so... I just love it. I would have these on my wall at home. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's that. And then if you did a culture, a dermatophyte, and that's what the fungal uh, that causes the in humans is called dermatophytes. It's all different kinds of fungal in fact, uh, fungal types. It's this white thing on this red base. It has to be a white furry colony. So that's penicillium. That's Canada. That is dermatophyte. So that would be positive. And we don't really care at this at the level that we're doing it. It's what what kind it is. Um, and then you would treat uh, either orally or topically. Um, so here's the second one. This one's really interesting. 16 year old comes in with these big bully on his fingers and bully are large blisters, whereas a vesicle is a smaller one. Um, and he had some areas of hyperpigmentation. He noticed him after he was out at the pool cutting limes for margaritas for his parents. So he came in like these huge, and this is very unusual. And you know, there's a whole category of rashes that are bullous. And um, a lot, most of them are um, autoimmune against certain proteins that are in the basement membrane between the epidermis and the dermis and some very other things. This is a little unusual, especially for his age. It's not really in a distribution for an um, IgA, uh, bolus disease, some of the other things that might be at his age. So, um, we actually, he didn't tell us initially that he had been cutting law or cutting limes, but, uh, we got to that point. And so our first most likely differential was phytophotodermatitis, secondary to limes. 
And I, we see this a lot, especially people who drink Corona. They might go to the beach and they come in and they have like a, it's like a, a line almost of brown. It's a very distinct look. And in his case, he had the actual blisters because he was right with the lime juice, like in a, in a, in a large quantity. Um, the other ones is kind of faint and you, and all you have to do is say, were you at the beach drinking Corona with limes? And they're like, oh my God, she's so smart. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's really interesting. And it's not just limes. There are other, um, uh, other plants that can do that. It doesn't happen if you're not in the sun. So it is directly related to the sun, uh, and the lime juice and the skin. And of course, allergic contact, which is, you know, like these, these are huge. This would be unusual for an allergic contact. And then obviously the third would be a bullous rash, which like I said, would, would be unusual to have that type in that age uh, for, for what would be normal at that age. Um, so the diagnosis based on history and clinical exam, obviously, I mean, when he was talking about limes, that made it to, to us uh, pretty much a, a, a done deal. Now, you know, sometimes you're going to be wrong. And, you know, so you, a lot of times you have to monitor and see how people respond to treatment before you make a decision, because not everything, especially with rashes, is cut and dry, even if you do a biopsy. Biopsies basically give you a category. So you can rule a whole bunch of stuff out. <laughs> but now you got this whole category and which one is it? Um, it? Now, if you really think they have an allergic contact dermatitis or something, then we can do patch testing, which tests for different allergens on the surface of the skin. It's different than a prick test. Um, prick test is an IgE test. This is completely different. And then, of course, the third most likely, and if you think it's a bullous di disease, we do direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence, which, which is... Um, they actually use fluorescent antibodies tagged against certain antigens. Um, and uh, you, you look for circulating antibody, which is the indirect, and then you look for direct on the actual skin. Um, so it's a, a, a lot of histology things. Um, but, but those were the two that I brought up. There's a whole, whole bunch more. <laughs> So you just never know, just like, you know, in, in any area, got to be ready for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Those are two great case studies. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> we have uh, any questions about the case studies specifically about tinea or phytodermatophosis, dermatotyphosis? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, we did have some um, someone ask, have you seen any skin reactions related to COVID or the COVID vaccine? You yeah, know, that's a good question. Yes. Uh, and Derma, the uh, American Academy of Dermatology does have a uh, um, forum where if you have anything that you want to submit, any any rashes or anything you think related to COVID, then you can can call and they compile it and you can review it at any time. Um, I have to tell you, I had one patient, I have been seeing her for years, never had a rash, especially mm -hmm. psoriasis. Yeah. She came in probably, I don't know, 10 days after her COVID vaccination and she was covered in psoriasis from head to toe. Wow. And, um, you know, you don't want to assume it's the, it's the COVID, but I knew something is not normal. Something different is happening here because she had no family history. She's never had anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, you know, we did a biopsy and uh, it was really bad. We ended up putting her on cyclosporin, which is a pretty potent immunosuppressive. Mm -hmm. um, but she only had to stay on it for maybe a month and, and then it, it was gone and it's never come back. And, oh and we God. feel pretty sure it was related to the to the vaccine. Wow. Have and you, I saw a couple of COVID arms. Yeah. H have you um, read anything else or heard about any other patients that had a similar um, uh, effect from the vaccine? Not that particular, yeah. no. Um, but it, I mean, people get kind of, you know, nondescript rashes, yeah. things like that. 
Um, and it's funny because I had somebody, I got COVID arm mm -hmm. and, uh, which is the big rash right around the, your, uh, injection site, but it came up a week after the injection. And, um, so then I had a patient that had the exact same thing and I knew that is COVID arm because I had it too, <laughs> but that's been actually well documented. So, um, but I haven't seen any like blue toes or which I think they think is probably really not COVID related, but ha honestly, I haven't seen a whole lot. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good thing that there haven't been a lot. <laughs> um, and actually I was wondering this as you were doing the case study, how did your practice change um, with, you know, the start and height of the pandemic? Like, did you guys have to like shut down or how did everything like, how, how was. Yeah. Was we were really fortunate. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, we didn't have to lay anybody off. Um, we were, we did telemedicine, which was interesting because I think that that really tested how well telemedicine would work. Mm -hmm. And we had to know that. So I think that that in, in, an, in that essence, it was a, it was a good thing. Um, and dermatology lends itself pretty well to teledermatology, telemedicine. And, um, of course, if, if we needed them to come in, then they could come in. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, our workload went way down. Um, but we would come in and, and at least be available for phone calls. If somebody yeah. had to call in for a telederm, you know, we were there. Um, and then uh, sometimes we would rotate. Somebody, one person would come in for emergencies. Another person would come in, you know. So obviously we didn't work as much. Um, but uh, we were lucky. We did. We did great. I know some people got laid off. One of the girls that's worked with us now did um, from another practice. And yeah. we're happy to have her. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad no one got laid off from your practice. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of people did. It was terrible. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of derma emergencies, uh, someone asked, have you ever been diagnosed or have you ever seen a patient uh, or diagnosed someone with necrotizing fasciitis? I always talk about them not missing something like that. <laughs> uh, no. Now I used to moonlight when I was in, when I worked in renal, uh, the, the, the infectious disease physician that we used to refer everything to, he asked me if I wanted to do rounds with him. So I would do rounds um, like one week in a month, infectious disease. Um, that, you know, necrotizing fasciitis, is, that's pretty, that's pretty rapidly progressing. Mm -hmm. It would be unusual to see that in the clinic. Yeah. Um, um, but, it, I mean, I would say, no, I've never seen that. I mean, actually, mm -hmm. I know of it in the hospital, but I've never actually seen a case of it. Mm. Yeah. Now Fourier's gangrene. Yeah. Which is pretty close to that. That's mm, yeah, that's bad. Oh my gosh. But I, 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 I wouldn't see that in the Durham office either. Um, you know, but we'll see, you know, and, and pretty significant staph infections, um, things like that, particularly patients that are diabetic, have poor circulation, you know, various things like that. But not that uh, necrotizing fasciitis. And I hope I don't. Yeah. <laughs> if I do, I hope I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I'm always talking about zebras. <laughs> yes, I know. Look for horses, though. Horses are more likely. But don't forget the zebras. That's true. All righty. Um, someone wanted to know, um, so was it uh, was so was the was it a combination um the phytodermatophosis, was it a combination of lime juice or, or the sun or was it a burn from the lime juice in the sun or was it considered a rash? I'm not sure. How. It's a rash. It's a bolus rash. Um, it is a toxic. It, when the sun and the lime, uh, there's a substance in the lime that is um, toxic to the skin. Mm -hmm. And when those two things come together, it creates this huge blistering rash. Mm, okay. Yeah. Ready. And there's other, there are other, uh, like I think celery, there's some, there are other um, things that can do that in, in the sun. And just like with patch testing, yeah. you can do photo patch testing because there are some substances that people will be allergic to only in the sun and right. not otherwise. 
which is not something people do on a regular basis, but it can be done. Okay. Um, how would you explain the differences between what you do and what an MD does? Well, I would say generally we do very similar things. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have to see as many patients, so I get to, I get to um, educate a little bit more, which I like. And, um, but, you know, I do have to know what my limitations are. I am not a physician. Okay. And, and you don't go four years of medical school all what they have, a fellowship, da, 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 da. I mean, you, you know, you know some stuff, okay? And I don't know what they know. I'm, you know, so I, I, I recognize that. Um, so I always keep that in the back of my mind. But I also know that I, I am I'm excellent at what I do. And I will, you know, I, if I need help, I'll ask for it. But, but generally speaking, we do very similar things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as you gain, you know, all your years of experience, I'm sure like at 20 years now, it's like, it's, it's really hard to like distinguish what you do and what the physician does. Yeah. And I think a lot of times now I don't, it's, <laughs> I feel like sometimes I'm wasting their time, but I really do it mostly for my patients because if they, I just feel like if they aren't completely with the program, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have, I just say, Hey, let's see, let's bring, let's bring my doc in. Let's see what he says. And you know, the three of us will figure it out. So. Mm -hmm. awesome. All righty guys. We have, I think I got um, the majority of the questions unless um, if I skipped around or whatnot, it's usually cause she answered it. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I got it. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so, okay, just to um, end it and tie everything together. So um, what's uh, what advice that you would give the students, you know, as they, you know, journey to applying to PA school and, you know, you know, getting accepted and or not getting accepted and um, then, you know, pro progressing to their professions? Well, you know, persistence pays. Um, you know, if you don't, if you really want to do it and you don't, and you don't get in on your first try, and that happens a lot, especially now because it is so competitive, if that's what you want to do, then you just got to keep on applying. Uh, you, you know, if, if you can get the information about what may have been wrong, you yeah. know, what happened at your last interview, what happened that you can work on, sometimes you can get that information, sometimes you can't. Um, but honestly, you really just need to be yourself. And <laughs> people, I mean, people, are, they're going to know whether, oh, my God, you know, I think I might like to see her as a PA sometime. You know, the, they're going to know kind of your personality and, um, you know, for that. And then when you, when you get in, you really, you're going to have to be disciplined. You know, you're just going to have to. You, I mean, you're going to have time for fun. But you really need to, you're going to have to buckle down. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was some great advice, guys. Persistent pays, being persistent pays. So remember that. Thank you so, so, so much, Sandy. For Thank you um, so much. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Thank you. Happy New Year for presenting the case studies. I learned a lot, so I'm sure they learned a lot. So um, thank you again. And um so guys, if you, I guess there's, there's no more questions, um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great learning about, you know, Durham and your expertise. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, you can end the session by, there should be like the, since you signed on before me, there should be like the um, phone. It was like a red phone button to uh, end call. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it, I can give you my email, if anybody's interested, if they want to. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Your contact info. If they, I'm sure they have questions. Um, okay, so uh, uh, just give it to you. Yeah, I can. Okay, say for you. Okay, it's Sandra. Okay. S a n d r a r o b rob s l at aol dot com. Okay. So this is her contact information, guys. It's Feel free. Awesome.
<laughs> so feel free to ask Sandy with um, any derm questions that you may have. Try not to bombard her. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry if you have like a ton of messages in your inbox. But That's okay. They're, I'm sure they're very appreciative of, you know, you taking the time to answer questions and help them. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It's a great, great program. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good night. Good night, guys. <laughs>